Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Marcia Eli from the Brooklyn Public Library and the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents. Tonight, it's my privilege to introduce a discussion about racial politics and emancipatory alternatives with two leading scholars and experts, Juliet Hooker, author of Black Reef, White Grievance, and Lori Balfour, whose recent book is Toni Morrison, Imagining Freedom. They're going to lead each other in conversation this evening in a dialogue about freedom, unfreedom, contrasting views on the route towards racial justice, and the intersections between their works. You can explore both of their new books, Hooker's Black Reef, White Grievance, and Balfour's Toni Morrison, Imagining Freedom. And if you choose, purchase them at an independent local bookstore by going to the links we're dropping in the chat. You also have the option for closed captioning tonight. That button is at the bottom of your screen. And finally, I invite you to share your questions with Drs. Balfour and Hooker type them into the uh, Q&A box that's also at the bottom of your screen throughout the, the program. So now it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit more about these two distinguished scholars and welcome them to join on camera. Lori Balfour is James Hart Professor of Politics and a core faculty member in the Department of American Studies at the University of Virginia. In addition to Toni Morrison, Imagining Freedom, she is the author of Democracy's Reconstruction, Thinking Politically with W.E. Du Bois, and The Evidence of Things Not Said, James Baldwin and the Promise of American Democracy. She's currently working on a book manuscript tentatively titled Reparations Unbound, Dilemmas of Dismantling Racial Justice. And Juliet Hooker is the Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence in Political Science at Brown University where she teaches courses on racial justice, black political thought, Latin American political thought, democratic theory, and contemporary political theory. In addition to black grief, white grievance, she is the author of Race and the Politics of Solidarity, Theorizing Race in the Americas, Douglas, Sarmiento, Dubois, and Vasconcelos. And she is editor of Black and Indigenous Resistance in the Americas from multiculturalism to racial backlash. It's such an honor to have you both joining us here tonight. I am really looking forward to your conversation and I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Marcia, for the introduction and thanks to the Center for Brooklyn History for um, inviting us. I'm particularly delighted and Honored to have a chance to talk with an old friend whose new book I so deeply admire. Um, and I, so I wanted to start with a general question about Black grief, white grievance. Um, Juliet, you opened the book with the observation that in political life, loss is widespread, but it is no by no means evenly distributed. Not only are Black and white communities subject to different kinds and degrees of political loss, but they respond in different ways. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the key features of what you call black grief on the one hand and white grievance on the other. Absolutely. Um, and I wanna preface this by saying also that I'm really happy to be here and to be in conversation with Lori and also um, to thank the Center for Black and History for hosting us. So the book makes the argument that black grief and white grievance are two um, ways in which people are responding to political loss and mobilizing around it, um, although very different forms of loss uh, in contemporary US, in the contemporary United States, and that they're two of the main drivers of um, contemporary racial politics. And by Black grief, I mean, um, you know, the, the way in which Black people have had to mobilize over and over throughout the history of the United States in response to really deadly losses, often, right, the loss of life, right? So um, lynchings in an earlier era or police killings in hours um, and, and the public mourning, right, the sort of mobilization of, of that grief has been the catalyst for various um, movements for 
um, you know, racial progress to try to, you know, change unjust um, racist relations throughout the history of the country, including if you think about one of the moments that I write about in the book is the, the public funeral of Emmett Till and how that ended up being an important catalyst for the civil rights movement. On the other hand, white grievance, which has also been a recurring feature of um, U.S. history, is um, our, as, you know, a response that some white citizens have to um, what they feel are illegitimate losses, right? To the sense that because they have been the dominant group in the history of the country, that they should be the priority in national debates and and hold political power, um, and so the response when you know when you know when they they feel that other groups are you know gaining rights is often to feel like this is um to feel a sense of displacement right we see um some of this in in contemporary rhetorics around let's say the idea of an immigrant invasion right this idea that we're being taken over by these others these foreigners and that is changing um the makeup of the country um, and then we also see it in the ways that 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 you know folks are responding sometimes to legitimate losses by refusing to accept those losses, right? By engaging in in attempts at election subversion or changing the rules of the game if the outcome was won by, let's say, a coalition of multiracial or primarily black voters whose votes aren't seen as those of the, let's say, that the real Americans as Sarah. Pam Palin um, would call them. And so I think what I'm arguing in the book is really that, you know, we have this kind of these kind of recurrent responses to loss and they um, and that we need to think about them simultaneously rather than separately because they um, they're not the same. Right. As you as you said, there are different kinds of responses to loss and to different kinds of loss, in one case, really material and deadly and ongoing. And the other, in many cases, anticipatory, right? Something that hasn't happened, a displacement that people fear, but that isn't yet the case. That's great. Thank you. And um, I wanted to um, actually turn to asking you a question about um, imagining freedom, because, of course, Morrison is one of our, you know, primary thinkers about the history of the United States and, and its racial um, past and, and, and how to wrestle with it. And in your book, you argue that political theorists and people in, in general have a lot to learn from her understanding of freedom. Um, and you, one of the things you say we can learn from her account of freedom is why a vision of freedom that is political and more than political has inspired people who have endured a lifetime of struggle. So can you say more about what this more than political vision of freedom we, we find in Morrison is and why you think it's important? Great, thanks so much, Juliet. Um, so as political theorists, I think we often um, think of political freedom, that is the freedom that we have as citizens as not only the highest form of freedom, but also um, the moment at which we're most free is when we are acting together as citizens or as fellow members of a kind of political project. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the people who are at the center of Morrison's novels are people who have been generally have not had political voice and maybe even to put it the point more strongly. And I think this connects up with what you say about the history of black grief people for whom American democracy has actually been threatening, has been dangerous. So um, these are men and women and children who may not be free in the kind of um, conventional way of, of voting, sometimes not even um, able to, uh, to protest openly, um, often living fugitive existence behind the backs of power, um, and so Morrison is trying to think about sort of how do they create worlds under those conditions, because they still are enacting freedom in different ways. So that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece is that for Morrison, um, who has this, as we all know, if you've read any of her fiction or her nonfiction, such an extraordinary gift for language. Um, and um, for her beauty and politics, um, 
go hand in hand. They meet as equals in her books. And at one point she says that she wanted her lit, um, her literary art to be unquestionably political and irrevocably beautiful. So the more than political also gets at the ways in which our political lives are also connected to our spiritual lives, are connected to the, our aesthetic lives, connected to the kind of everyday practices that people put in place, even when they don't have the kinds of formal attributes of, of freedom. Um, and um, so we can think about, you know, one of the things she's able to do as a novelist is to give us just so many moments um, where um, people are able to um, enact or even to steal freedom in important respects. So whether it's a group of enslaved men and beloved who create community over roasted potatoes, um, you know, uh, that they are not supposed to um, have access to, or a brother and sister in the novel Home who have been the subject of enormous violence, in the case of the brother who has also participated in violence, who find a way to heal themselves and each other in part through um, a, a burial um, of a black man who was um, murdered um, many years, many years before. So these are the ways in which um, Morrison tries to understand what kind of free agency might look like in the absence of political freedom, which doesn't mean the political freedom isn't important, but it isn't everything. And I think um, one of the things that working with um, a, a writer like Morrison, who continually reminds us that the point of reading is not simply to get to the argument. Um, in fact, she says again and again, she's not interested in explaining or vindicating black life, but in exploring it in all of its complexity. And I think that that's one of the things um, that emerges interestingly in your book, um, even though your central figures are not novelists, um, but in the way in which you use the interludes um, that appear between the chapters of the book. So you have this carefully crafted argument. And in between, we have moments where we have an excerpt from poet Claudia Rankin. We have an extraordinary photograph. We have video. Um, and each of these interludes works, I think, on the reader in a different way. Um, and, and provides a kind of bridge from one chapter to the other. And so I'm wondering if you could say something about how and why you draw on art um, as part of the larger argument that you make in the book. Absolutely. Um, you know, and I think this is something that that is a, a kind of shared theme across our text, right? This idea of, of, of how do you try to tell these stories? Um, and how and how do you try to 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 think about them? And I think one of the reasons that I turn to the 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 interludes is because I think there is ways in which, you know, um, the way in which we have been trained, right, as political theorists, to write about, um, um, you know, about the themes and topics that we're we're interested in. That sometimes the social scientific, you know, approach doesn't always capture everything that you that you need to, or that there, you feel like there's a responsibility in how you need to tell the story. And so I thought that I would actually share some of the images, some of the interludes so people could see um, what we are talking about. And let me see if I can get this to work, right. So this is one of the, the images um, that is an interlude that is before the chapter on um, black protests in which I look at kind of the history of black protests and the way in which we have these very constrained expectations about how black people need to protest in this extremely civil and peaceful manner in order to get their, um, their, um, their grievances heard. And before I even get into the chapter, I think this image just captures that idea right and then there and it raises all sorts of questions about you know who is this person who is there in her sundress right confronting this militarized police response who are the bystanders by the tree what are they thinking 
and doing as they watch this unfold. And so there is a way in which I think the, you know, the interludes were a way to get the reader in and thinking about um, all of those issues without me having to spell them out. And in some ways, they also captured things that, um, that I, or, or, reach spaces that were different than the kind of rational follow the argument along through the pages, right? And that's an important theme in the book as well, this idea that, you know, that the way in which we we approach um, issues isn't just in terms of like, you know, the, the sort of apprehension of fact, but that it's also about how we are engaged emotionally, effectively, um, and um, and in this is another one that you mentioned. This is the interlude before the chapter on on white grievance in the book, and this is a beautiful, very short poem by Claudia Rankin. And and one of the things that I I love about this is this way in which she's right. She's playing with this idea of policing, but also the 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 idea of imagination, and that already sets up, you know, one of the arguments in the book about in the chapter about how you know, looking at white grievance is really about looking at the, the stories that um, that many white people have told themselves about the history of this country and how that shapes how they respond to loss. And so for me, there is a way in which the interludes do some things that I I didn't know that I was actually going to be able to convey. And, and they work kind of alongside and with the arguments then that the chapters um, try to try to develop. Um, so I'm going to now try to stop sharing. And um, I wanted to ask you um, a, a question about how you chose, I mean, you just asked me about the interludes <laughs> and I'm gonna ask you some questions about your choices, which is, you know, Morrison left behind such a rich body of work. It must have been impossible to make choices about what to include and what not to. So how did you make those choices and, and how was that shaped by, you know, by this being a book that was focused on her thinking about freedom? Um, and relatedly, why focus on freedom when, I mean, there are so many other things that we could also talk about in Morrison. So I wondered if you could tell us some more about that. Right. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I I think um, maybe I'll answer the second question first in some senses. So at the time that I was writing, and, and this is still equally true today, um, freedom, I think the meanings of freedom were pulling apart in this country in a way that perhaps wasn't unprecedented, but has really shaped our political lives, our social lives, which is to say that Freedom has become both an instrument of violence on the one hand, particularly anti-Black violence, and on the other hand, it's been the source of emancipatory movements. And we see this across U.S. history, but I think in the 21st century, especially the gap between, say, freedom as property rights on the one hand and freedom as some kind of collective vision of justice on the other um, couldn't be more um more extreme and um, and of course freedom is one of if not the most um, powerful words in the African American literary tradition. Um, so that Morrison is not alone in this. But I started thinking about Morrison and freedom actually in the classroom. Um, I've been teaching Beloved for many years. And what I found was that every time I went back to the novel, I was really struck. This is a novel that came out in 1987 that tells the story of, um, uh, it centrally focuses on an enslaved woman who um, attempts, who both escapes from slavery um, and also brings her children with her. Um, and, um, and how she struggles um, to create a free life uh, through the continuing violence um, that follows her. And, um, because I kept returning to the notion of freedom as I was working through the novel with um, with students, it struck me that that was kind of that was kind of the core in some senses of the argument. And there's no question that um, every chapter could have just been about beloved. 
Um, but what I ended up doing was thinking about um, a selection of her novels and also of her nonfiction work. I mean, she left an extraordinary body of essays and speeches um, and critical, um, critical work, um, but thinking about sort of how some of her novels would work in pairs, it's speaking to each other. So um, historical novels um, like A Mercy and Jazz, speaking about the 17th century and the jazz age, or um, novels that looked at flight out of um, bondage into something like freedom. And I looked at Song of Solomon and Home. So those are just two examples. But part of what emerges, I think, from all of these novels is that for Morrison, um, freedom is not abstract. It's concretely realized in relationships that people forge with each other, which means it's also not individual in the way that often political theorists, political philosophers um, focus on freedom as you know, non-interference by the state or society or non-domination um, that, and um, Morrison offers us a positive account of what it means to get free, but also an account of just how difficult it is. Um, Angela Davis has a book entitled Freedom as a Constant Struggle. And I think that's very much um, dramatized or vivified in, um, in Morrison's novels. Um, but there is no question that there were hard choices. Um, and in fact, one novel I don't think I'd do justice to, I mean, one can't do justice to any of them, but I was particularly dissatisfied with in the book was uh, Morrison's 1997 novel, Paradise. So I ended up writing an article after the book was over to try to come to terms with um, what I hadn't said about Paradise. But I think... You know, the key thing that um, you get across all of um, Morrison's work that I think is not emphasized enough um, is that um, what we often take to be freedom, what is sometimes called white freedom, um, cannot be dependent on the subjection or enslavement of another. And so Morrison really pushes that point. Um, she was famous for saying that the function of freedom is to free somebody else. And that's an idea that she keeps returning to um, and, and exploring. And I think there's a, a nice connection between many of, um, of the central figures in Morrison's novels, many of whom are, are Black women. Um, and um, two of the central figures in your book, um, <laughs> Uh, Harriet Jacobs and Ida B. Wells, who emerge from your text as really crucial political thinkers. Um, and they are both have very powerful individual stories, but also very um, forceful critiques of white supremacy and, and white democracy. And I would love to hear you say a little bit about what they might teach readers about how to transform personal experiences of loss um, into political resistance in the context of pervasive violence and oppression. Absolutely. So, um, you know, so one of the, the things that I argue in the book is that we need to, to think about uh, Jacobs and Wells as theorists of loss and that they offer us a way to think about how to approach loss in, 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 in a productive way, but also in a non-instrumental way. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the response to loss is often, and particularly I think to black grief, right? To these instances of repeated loss has been that we need to turn it into activism, that it needs to spur mobilization for racial justice. And I think that is at work, of course, in, in what Jacobs and Wells are doing. They're both appealing to readers who on the one hand, right, um, embrace abolition and, and reject slavery in Jacobs's case um, through her story of her own um, experiences as an enslaved woman who flees um, and self-emancipates herself. And then in Wells, we, you know, we get, of course, these powerful accounts of, um, of white violence, of, of you know, lynching, um, throughout her career, but also all the reporting that she does on race massacres and white race riots. Um, and in, 
all of their texts, however, I think there's an attempt to balance grief and grievance. And by this, I mean that, yes, they're making these appeals and they're making um, this violence and, and, and death and, and suffering that Black people are, are, um, are being subjected to, as well as white, you know, um, white anger, white, you know, rage. Um, they're making it quite visible, but they're also paying attention to the kind of communities, you know, as you were saying with Morrison, to how people manage to survive and to find ways to care for e each other and build lives amid these, um, you know, these unjust conditions. And so it's not simply, you know, let's use this for, um, you know, um, creating kind of social progress, but it's also, you know, I think in both of their texts, we find a kind of attention also to the to daily life, right? So it's not the focus as, if you will, if you think about, you know, these big moments of, of protests or, you know, of, of resisting injustice, but it's about how you resist in the daily quotidian taking care of yourself and of each other of creating community. Um, in the case of Jacobs, right, it's the story of her, you know, um, the enorm the amazing community that she has with her family, who are some of whom have managed to free themselves, some of whom are still enslaved, and the enormous work that goes into trying to pre to um, to um, to try to preserve those ties in the context of slavery, and in the case of of um, Wells, what we get is is what I, you know is a basically a, a litany of loss that commemorates the lives lived, not just the lives that are foreclosed by violence, right? So we get these amazing little details that tell us who these people were, right? So you know when she tells the stories um, in, of the East St. Louis, the victims of the East St. Louis massacre, uh, which was a, a white race riot. Um, in, in 1917, she tells us the stories of, of the possessions that people lost. And in telling those stories, we get a picture of the lives they lived, that they had bought records and that they, you know, they owned phonographs that, that they lost, you know, this life that they had put together. Um, and so I think part of what we get from Jacobs and, and Wells is, is this, right, you know, this, this, these two of the lessons we get, right? One is about balancing, right? The need for resistance, but thinking also about, you know, that resistance includes life and not just this kind of public activism. And then also thinking about how to tell those stories in an ethical way that pays attention to people's lived experience and the ways that they, that they manage to, to survive and thrive. And that, actually brings me to a question for you about um, the focus of Morrison's fiction, which is often, as we were saying, on um, Black women and girls. And, you know, as, as many of us no doubt remember, there's an effort to, um, to police what was taught in schools in Virginia that was ostensibly spurred by concerns about students reading Beloved. Um, so, you know, how do you, what do you think, what are the truths about Black women's lives and Black life in general that Morrison is trying to tell us and why are some people still so afraid of confronting them? That's a terrific question. Um, and, and, and I, one way maybe to, to answer it would be to go back to what you just said actually about Wells and East St. Louis. Um, I mean, I was really struck when you were talking about the ways in which Wells examines the kinds of um, objects that created the lives that were lost in the East St. Louis riots. And um, Morrison picks this up. At, and I, I wonder to what extent she's in direct conversation. She's certainly in indirect conversation in this longer kind of genealogy with Wells in the novel Jazz, where one of the um, key characters is orphaned by, um, by that massacre and comes to... Um, a city that is thought to be, you know, New York City um, in the in the aftermath. And um, and one of the things that Morrison does, I think, so powerfully actually is to give us these kind of vivid pictures of what the 
objects were in the lives um, that these women and men um, were creating. Um, with regard to questions about sort of what's so dangerous, what's so frightening um, about this work, um, I mean, it was really quite striking um, uh, as, a, as a Virginian, I guess I would say at this point in 2021 to um, watch a TV ad in which a parent, a white woman, um, told voters that um, uh, that the Democratic candidate was going to expose their children to what she called the most explicit material you can imagine. Um, and Beloved was not named, but she had been uh, part of an effort to um, require parental notification before material like Beloved was um, taught in schools. Um, her son encountered it as a high school senior, um, 18, um, and and one of the things that is so striking about sort of the um, these campaigns and other efforts to um, uh, to protect school children from Black history, from the truth about Black history, um, first of all, is how much is um, is hidden in the the efforts themselves, and by this I mean like the language of explicit. Um, connected to a scene, a sexual scene that is actually not especially explicit, but it conjured the horror and other readers have, white readers in particular, have responded in the same way. The people were affronted by some of the depictions of sexuality in Beloved and elsewhere, especially in The Bluest Eye, um, uh, Morrison's first novel, and yet not shocked, not staggered, not appalled or offended by slavery, um, by the kind of racist conditions that her characters are inhabiting. And this is something Morrison actually remarked on at one point. She got a bunch of letters from a group of high school students who said, why do you talk so much about sex? And she's like, wait a minute. <laughs> What's um, one, she doesn't. And two, um, you know, I think there is a way in which we um, are um not willing as a, a you know collectively as a um to confront um the racial violence the sexual violence the economic violence that have um been central to american democratic life from the beginning and so when morrison focuses on black women and girls who are not defined by it um, but must um, persist in the face of it. Um, the, she says the the people know and inquired of. Um, they tell a very different story about what um, what American democracy is. And I think they unsettle the myths um, that many of us hold dear. Um, and they provide a, you know, also provide a compelling alternative to the heroes that um, we are we are taught to, you know, to to look up to. And and you know, I, I mean, I do think that many of these efforts, um, I mean, the bluest eye is often on the top banned list. Um, that that these efforts to control what is taught in schools, what's available in school libraries, are indications of just how powerful these books are. Um, I mean, Morrison was acutely aware in her Nobel lecture, she talks about the ways in which violent, I'm uh, sorry, the ways in which language can do violence. It can also create new possibilities. Um, and she explores that in a way um, that I think is, is threatening to the status quo and deliberately so. Um, and, um, and also, I think it, it may be easy to forget how courageous um, her own writing was. So when she wrote Beloved, it was at a time at which there was very little appetite um, for remembering slavery. Maybe hard to, you know, we have such fierce fights now about what can be remembered about Confederate monuments and so forth. But in the 1980s, she said nobody wanted to remember this story. And yet she created this extraordinary um account in um because she felt that it was essential um that 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 basically that she had a responsibility to to inhabit the lives 
of these women and men who um, who had been erased by official history in important respects. Um, so I wanted to turn from that question to a, um, a question about um, what happens at the end of your book, um, where you make a crucial distinction between repairing on the one hand and salvaging on the other hand, democracy in the US. And I think one of the crucial insights of the book is the black political activists um, are often judged by the degree to which their actions are geared towards repairing a white democracy. And I think even that image that you showed, that powerful image from Baton Rouge, where you had um, such courage and such grace um, in the face of this militarized police also suggests that that's the good way, the right way to protest, the not to be visibly angry, not to destroy property and so forth. Um, and, and so I think you raise a really um, critical question about sort of how black act, political activism is judged. You also offer, I think this really amazing intervention at the very end where you talk about salvaging. We talk a lot about repair. We talk a lot about reparations. And you write in here, I quote, the aim of salvaging is not to repair the ship, but to dismantle white democracy, to strive for a better future in which the communities built from the wreckage can survive. Um, and I want to hear a bit about how this idea of salvaging might help us to envision a form of democracy that's unlike the visions and the versions that we have seen before. Thank you for that question. So I I started to think because about this question of, of salvaging because I was, you know, one of the things that I say very um, explicitly in the book is that this is not a book about how we're going to perfect um, democracy, um, because that's often how people responded when I, you know, when I was presenting the book, which is like, well, you make this critique, but what are you saying? You know, how should we think about, you know, black activism or, or our responses to loss? How can it, you know, um, actually lead to, to, um, to, you know, progress around racial justice? And, and part of, you know, what I'm trying to do is precisely to say we need to resist the move, the immediate move to that script because it, it really constrains Black political activism and it constrains the kind of humanity of Black people because, right, you're not allowed to be angry at injustice, you're not allowed to, to feel all of the, the, the feelings of grief and, and sorrow because you have to become this kind of heroic activist who's kind of saving um, you know, the, the political community. And, and so I came to thinking about, you know, I knew I wanted to resist this, this move to, to repair, but then I was like, well, I do need to say something about you know, what do we do? Um, and so that's how I came on salvaging because for me, it seemed to capture the sense of, um, you know, that it's not about repair suggest, you know, you get home repairs done, right? That the house is basically fine and you're kind of fixing things around the edges. And I was like, that's not what we need, you know? We actually need to start from scratch. And so this image of taking stuff from the wreckage or taking that which is discarded, and this comes to, you know, go back goes back to your point about who Morrison sees herself writing about, those who haven't been seen, right? that we take those things that we have refused, that we that is refuse. And from that, we try to build something new that's better. Um, and I think that this is a really important message too, because often right in this political moment, I feel like the, the response is to say, for example, in, in, in response to Trumpism, oh, we just need to get back to normal and we need to get back to following the rules and we need to get back to, but. But the problem is that normal wasn't working well for everyone, right? And so how do we think beyond that simply, let's get back to this status quo rather than, than thinking about the features of US democracy that are still weren't working well and still aren't for a lot of people? And how do we expand our imaginations to think in that way? Um, and so that's also what I'm trying to get back 
trying to get to with this language of of salvaging rather than than repairing the the house of U.S. democracy, which is which is not in good shape. And that actually brings me to a question for you, because you had your book um, talking about responsibility, um, which obviously ties into this question. And, um, you know, one of the dominant ways in which, you, as you know, we think about freedom and responsibilities as this kind of individual thing, right? If you have the ability to choose, then you have to live with the consequences of your choices. And this is true of many of Morrison's characters, but you also say that Morrison's fiction calls us to contemplate what the story she tells demands demand of us as readers. So can you say more about how you see this theme of responsibility in Morrison works and what she's calling us to do? Yeah, thanks, Juliet. I um, you know, I th I think I was already hyper attuned to questions of responsibility precisely because of this moment that we're living in that you described. I mean, the era of personal responsibility. I mean, we had in the 90s welfare reform is the per, you know personal responsibility and work opportunity act um immigration reform also in terms of personal responsibility always imposing new demands on um particularly on poor women of color um and um within political theory i mean we we importantly distinguish between um, you know, freedom and license and responsibility is a key. So I'm not saying we should never take responsibility for our actions. And, um, and Morrison um, addresses this, I think, across, um, across all her novels, all of them in different ways. Um, but one of the things I was struck by was how often she uses that language. Um, we see it in interviews that she gave, we see it in the novels, um, we see it in um, uh, the forewords that she added to her novels sort of when they were reissued in the early part of this century. I mean, especially in Beloved, where she talked about what would it mean to think about freedom in a context in which taking responsibility for your children was a crime. Um, and that becomes kind of the animating question in the whole, um, the whole novel. She also pushes back against the idea that um, so frequently in the ways in which um, in public discourse, um, responsibility is figured in such a way that particularly black women, black women and girls are figured as irresponsible. Um, so we think about debates about welfare reform in particular, and um, she has this fantastic critique of this idea that emerges uh, before many of those debates in 19, um, 1970 or 71, when she publishes this essay in the New York Times called What the Black Woman Thinks About Women's Lib. And she really gets, a, she sort of, we get a catalog of all of the things that Black women have been responsible for. Um, and um, sort of how uh, how the understanding of women's liberation, meaning white women's liberation, effaces, um, effaces all of that. So these themes um, recur across her work, um, but I think that, that there are also maybe three other dimensions of responsibility that I, I, are worth mentioning. Two that Morrison takes on for herself and one that she, um, one that she sort of gifts to her readers. So for herself, I mean, Morrison, writes very eloquently about the responsibility she feels to the um, cultural and aesthetic traditions of Black communities so that she wants to, um, to be true to a culture on the page, um, even when she's writing, say, about oral traditions or about um, other kinds of, of traditions. So she, she feels a deep responsibility as a writer um, to a kind of truth about the people she is creating. Um, the second is that she also, as I said before, I mean, she sees language as extraordinarily powerful. So she also is very concerned about sort of how to write in a way that doesn't um, minstrelize, that doesn't, you know, provoke kind of voyeurism um, that doesn't seek to explain black life to 
a white readership or to vindicate um, black humanity, that she really wants to let the language um, do its work without being um, caught up in reinforcing existing relations of power in some way. But that leaves the reader. So, I mean, one of the reasons that Morrison's novels, um, some readers find Morrison's novels very difficult, is that she does not give you everything. And that's on purpose. I mean, she says she creates spaces um, where the reader is supposed to enter. And um, that she says the social act creates the reading experience. Um, and so part of the way in which she understands that interplay between reader and writer is very demanding because, um, and this gets to a word that is critical for across your book, um, imagination. It's she needs a reader who is willing to step outside of existing racial structures, existing stereotypes, and um, enter into the world that she's creating. And um, so that um, that it's not simply a kind of passive experience where she's just giving us this lovely story, but she is really expecting that we as readers will, you know, come to the work with an openness um, and a willingness to go places that are not always comfortable. Um, and she also, um, I think, you know, trust the reader. And I think that's really important because she sees literature as particularly at a time um, when public discourse is often so impoverished, um, sees literature as a space where you can have a kind of exchange, um, where it's possible to imagine um, how to get outside of um, uh racist kinds of ways of thinking. Um, and so in many ways, it's not the same as a kind of political movement, but she's interested in moving readers. And she uses that language um, from a place where, you know, we have a status quo that we accept and we understand to some place that we haven't been before. And I think that's very much connected to um, you know, this idea of creating um, communities out of the wreckage um, with which you end your book. Um, and I wonder if we should open it to questions. I can't see the questions, but maybe either you or Marsha can see them. Yes, I think we have a question. Um, so, um, okay, here's the first question. Um, really interested in the idea of repairing versus salvaging. This is from Alan. An argument can be made that we're beyond the point of repair, even if that were preferable to some. So what in our political, economic, cultural structures is worth salvaging and how can that be achieved? So I guess I should start given that I brought up the topic, but I hope you will help me out. Um, so I think there's a lot that we need to, um, you know, that we need to change. But thinking about, you know, one of the things that I, I, I have felt um, hopeful about is, for example, if you look at um, the states where you have had, you know, these features of direct democracy, they've often led actually to very positive outcomes. So the, you know, when you've had referendums on things like Medicare expansion, on abortion rights, when people have been asked, you know, to come out and, and you know, and express themselves. I think that has been um, a very, you know, a very positive experience. In fact, it's led some, um, for example, after the latest, um, you know, uh, decision in, in Ohio, some um, folks to say, oh, maybe we, this is too much direct democracy, right? So I think there are ways in which um, that's something to build on, right? Because part of the problem is that our political system isn't responsive, right? That, you know, I was just reading something, I think last week about how, you know, because of the electoral college, the votes, the presidential election is going to be decided by the votes of very few people in a very few number of states. And that means all of us to feel, you know, I think, except for those very few people to feel disengaged. And so I think that's one of the things that I think is worth um, repairing is worth holding on to and salvaging and making more 
of. Um, I think the other thing that I, I think has come out of, you know, some of the, 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 the social movements in, in recent years, beginning with Occupy Wall Street and then with the, um, the movement for Black Lives has been a real critique of the, the you know, the, the, the yawning um, enormous economic inequality that has, you know, that characterizes our current moment. And then also a turn to say, let's think about what we are investing in and let's think about what kind of state we have to have. So if we look back to the moment of the, the pandemic, right, there was a moment in which we actually had um, a state that was do doing things to take care of people in these really very direct ways. And I think that that vision of something um, of a state that actually does that rather this, rather than simply tries to police and manage, um, you know, manage people in a certain way is one that comes out of that critique of like, you know, what kind of structures do we want? You know, what kind of economy? And if we think about the current, you know, upsurge in labor organizing, um, I think that's also been very positive and the kind of solidarity with that. Um, and so I think there are ways in which people you know, underneath the sort of terrible headlines where we can see things that people are doing that are actually quite positive and that are worth holding on to. But Lori, I don't know what you think about this question. No, I, I, I agree um, with, with your response um, completely. Uh, one of the things too that I found very inspiring, I mean, you know, even as universities are complicated places to be in this particular moment, um, when I was finishing my doing my graduate work and and started teaching, one of the things that we regularly bemoaned was um, that we had these incredibly intelligent students who were not particularly active or engaged. And I don't think anybody can say that anymore, that there is um, I mean, there's an enormous um, amount of passion and, and often division, but it's it's encouraging to me that even as much of our national leadership is is less youthful, that um, we have um, really animated um, generations of of um, younger people who are not willing to accept the status quo um, and who are incredibly creative about thinking about different ways. Um, not only to demand change, but also to sustain each other, to create new kinds of um, community. Um, and, I, you know, even though I, I take the point um, about repair very seriously, and I, I agree completely that the idea that, um, that you know, that the, the suggestion that what we need is just a kind of, you know, a new co coat of paint, um, or <laughs> to tinker around the edges is um, leaves untouched um, all of the injustice that has been built in, you know, con you know that's that's been constitutive of U.S. democracy. And I think that's one thing that was worrisome for me about many of the commentaries that were talking about Trumpism as unprecedented, and we've never seen this kind of. Um, attack on the truth. And I was thinking, what did it take to sustain Jim Crow? If not, you know, and this is the lesson that Ida B. Wells um, offers. I do think that one of the places where we're seeing um, a kind of um, this kind of new generation moving away from old models in creative ways is actually in thinking about reparations um, so that it's not simply an orientation towards you know, one national program, but a proliferation of efforts at the local level, at state levels, um, and also transnationally. So that um, if we think about, say, the Movement for Black Lives, their reparations toolkit, they're connecting reparations for slavery to contemporary inequalities, many of the economic inequalities um, that Juliet mentioned, they're connecting um, the concerns of, um, Black activists, with indigenous activists, with environmental justice, with um, and and trying to see how these different um, efforts can can um, build on each other, rather than having a kind of single architecture, like you know a blueprint that um, somehow is going to work top down. 
there's a, um, I think there's a way in which many of these um, younger people and many of these activists are taking a lesson from the success of the, um, of conservative activists who have long taken lessons from the left, but also to see the value of local organizing, to see the value of going into like every dimension of our political lives and as worthy of our attention. Um, and that I think is is very exciting, especially as long as we have an electoral college, as Juliet pointed out. I don't know if there are other questions. I think that was the only one so far. So if you have any questions of any kind, please um, please go ahead um, and share. But um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask you, Lori, a completely unfair question, which is, um, you know, if you had to choose a favorite, I know, I told you it was unfair, but but what are, you know, what are your, your favorite Morrison texts? Wow. So that is, that is unfair. I will say that's a question I often ask audiences when, when I'm talking about Morrison. So maybe I should, um, you know, return it to you. I mean, one thing that's, I'm, I can't pick a novel um, because there are so many and um, they do so many different things. But um, one of the things that I think, you know, if you're just going to grab one Morrison book that you might not have gotten, um, her last collection of essays and addresses and meditations called, um, interestingly in the UK, it came out as Mouthful of Blood and um, <laughs> in the US as the source of self-regard. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, um, really remarkable and really gives you a sense of the breadth of, um, of her thinking. And even when she's giving a lecture, when she's giving her Nobel lecture, she's telling a story. Um, how about you? Do you have a favorite Morrison novel? Oh, now, now you've turned my unfair question on me. So I don't know that I would say I have a, a favorite, but I am. Um... I think I've most recently been thinking a lot about a mercy and I just find that so, so useful in some ways for thinking about our present moment, even though it said, it's said in the 17th century, right? But there's, there's a way when she's, she's trying it to tell the story about, about the U.S. that can help us think about it differently. Um, but we actually, we have a question um, from the Q&A, which is um, that, from Susan, I'd love to hear Juliet talk more about the notion of anticipatory grief and how it relies on imagination and hope as well. Um, this is a really good question. So I use the, the notion of anticipatory grief to talk about how that is, is, is driving white grievance, right? Because if you think about um, the sense of, of um, you know, worries about changing demographics in the United States, right? That hasn't happened yet. And yet, you know, there are, there are all of these conspiracy theories or, and, you know, great replacement theory, this idea that there is this, this, um, this concerted effort to try to, um, to change the character of the country and displace um, whites as, as the dominant group. And so that for me, it, you know, the way in which people are mobilizing to try to, to prevent that, right, to, because, is because they see it as leading to these apocalyptic outcomes. But we don't know what demographic change is going to do. But there are all these assumptions that what it will mean is this sense of, of, of white subjugation, right? That it will it will lead to somehow um, displacement. And so for me, the, the, the notion of anticipatory grief is this sense of, um, you know, the kind of, there is a loss that is to come and we're not only mobilizing now to prevent that or in response to that, but we're also assuming that we know what the effects of that will be, right? And often it's seen in apocalyptic terms, right? That this is, you know, that it's not just a, a gain for other groups, it's a defeat for, um, for my group. And so in that sense, I think imagination is really important to it because, you know, it's, if you think about, you know, some of the rhetoric, anti-immigrant rhetoric um, 
you know, what we see is this, this kind of, um, the story that people are telling, right, that doesn't quite fit what's happening, but that is doing all of this work. Um, and I think that, that, you know, hope plays into it because I think instead of seeing, um, you know, instead of seeing possibility, right, in, in what might come, let's say, of demographic change, the hope that a lot of people are being mobilized by, some people find that hopeful, others don't, but it's because they're trying to preserve this, this nostalgic idea of what the U.S. Um, was, that it never was, as Morrison's fiction tells us. Um, and we have a final question um, from Alan. Is there any current author who you think continues in the Morrison tradition in terms of themes and our language? Laurie, I'm going to hand that to you. Oh, goodness. There's... There's so much. I mean, so in the in the scholarly um, world, this is not uh, she's not a fiction writer, but uh, Farah Jasmine Griffin, who is a great Morrison scholar, but also has written beautiful books about um, black life and and history would be an example. Um, I just received I haven't read it yet. Jasmine Ward's new book, mm -hmm. uh, I think, um, Honoré Fanon Jeffers, uh, both as a poet and as a novelist, has um, done extraordinary work that in many ways um, is is attentive to, is faithful to language, is um, enmeshed in history. I mean, you can learn so much about historic, so much historical detail from Morrison, but also um, is very much dedicated to um, to memory. So, for instance, she has an entire book of poems that's dedicated to um, the memory of Phyllis Wheatley. And I just give that as one example. That's, it's, you know, I, I haven't yet figured out how to read poetry, but um, I admire it very deeply. And Claudia Rankin, who um, Juliet cites would be another example. Great question. Wow, um, <laughs> you know, that hour go, goes by really quickly when you're listening to the two of you wrestling with some of these questions. Um, I just wanna thank you both uh, for this really thoughtful, fascinating conversation, um, unpacking both of your, 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 your books, but also just your, your great knowledge. Um, and I think that we all wrestle with some of the themes that uh, everyone in this country that you've touched on tonight and um, listening to you um, is, has, is, a, is, is, is helpful and full of insights. So thank you both so much for being part of this. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. And I wish everybody a lovely rest of the evening. Good night. <laughs>